Heavy is the head that wears the crown. On the show Game of Thrones, the Night King was a character introduced as the leader of the Others. Once a member of the First Men, this mortal man was captured by the Children of the Forest and turned into a supernatural living weapon. This was done out of desperation as the Children were losing the war with the First Men. Their land was being stolen, their people put to the sword their sacred trees consigned to the flames. And so they chose the nuclear winter option in dealing with their enemies. However, no such character exists in the books. The leader of the others is said to be the Great Other, a deity whose name must not be spoken. It is the rival of the red god Rolor, ice against fire. But there was once a historical figure from the Age of Heroes known as Night's King. This so-called Knight's King was not the leader of the Others, their creator, nor was he an Other himself. He was something else, more myth than man. According to George R. R. Martin, Knight's King is not likely to have survived into the present. Knight's King is long dead. Still, history in A Song of Ice and Fire can be cyclical. What has happened before may, in turn, happen again. With that in mind, another character may follow a similar path to that of the legendary character of old. In this video, I will discuss the three candidates who may be next in line to become a new Knight's King. On our way to the theories, please do me the honor of liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and turning on notifications. And now, on with the video. Let us recall the key details of Knight's King's story so that we know what to look for as we search for his successor. Knight's King broke all the major tenets of the Knight's Watch's vows. He claimed a crown, he held lands, and he took a bride. It is said he even made sacrifice to the others. His bride was said to be a woman with pale white skin and bright blue eyes, like stars. Knight's King ruled for 13 years until the King Beyond the Wall and the King in the North combined their forces to cast him down. Once the enormity of his crimes were discovered, his name was stricken from history. There are three characters who I think may become the new Knight's King. Mance Raider, Jon Snow, and Stannis Baratheon. All three men are kings of a certain degree. Mance claimed the title of King Beyond the Wall by defeating his rivals. Stannis is King Robert's true heir. The Iron Throne is his by rights. Jon Snow is at the head of the Targaryen line of succession. All three men have ties to the Night's Watch. Mance was once a sworn brother. Stannis Baratheon has taken the Night Fort as his own seat of power and is considered the castle's commander. Jon Snow is the current Lord Commander of the Watch. All three men have taken brides, but out of the three, only Stannis Baratheon still remains a wedded man. Jon Snow lost his first love, the spearwife Egret, when she joined her fellow free folk on the first assault against the wall. Mance Raider lost his bride, Dala, a wildling woman, when she died in childbirth. And the differences only continue from here. Out of all three men, only Stannis claims a crown. Jon has never claimed one. He is still unaware of his Targaryen heritage. It may well be that when he finds out who he is, and that he is heir to the Iron Throne, he might not want it. He never has. The title of Lord of Winterfell is what Jon aspired to. Mance Raider lost his crown after his host was smashed in a day of bloody battle beneath the wall. Selyss and her queensmen have crowned another wildling to be their king, though it is highly unlikely he would be accepted as their ruler. This Magnar of Thin. The wildlings follow strength, not names. And it is not up to the kneelers of the south to assign them leaders. Only Stannis and Mance have fathered children. However, Mance's infant son has been sent away in secret to escape being burned for his king's blood. Stannis's child, on the other hand, is still quite close. As you can see, the differences between the men have become quite stark and only one of them stands out as being a strong candidate for kingship. It is Stannis Baratheon who maintains his kingship, who claims the Nightfort as his seat of power, 
who still has a bride and whose daughter remains at the wall. It is Stannis Baratheon who will become a new Night's King. As I mentioned earlier in this video, Selyse Baratheon is Stannis' queen. However, it is whispered among Stannis' followers that Melisandre, the Shadowbinder from Ashai, is his true queen. She is the one who declared Stannis Azor a High Reborn. She shares his bed where Selyse does not. She is by his side even when Stannis wants no other company. Night's King's original corpse queen was blue. Melisandre is red, ice, and fire. In fact, there is a figurine of Melisandre that was sculpted and painted to represent the red woman in all of her red finery. George R. R. Martin requested an alternate version of the sculpture be made. This one painted all in blue. Is this a clue from Martin that Melisandre is meant to be a modern day version of the Blue Eyes Corpse Queen? It is believed Melisandre is older, much older than her appearance. She herself has said she has practiced her art for years beyond count. The blood that flows out of her when she is lost in a vision of the flames is described as being hot and black, like me. This also matches the description of Beric Dondarrion's blood when he is mortally wounded by the Hound during the Hound's fiery trial by combat. Thoros of Myr has brought Beric back from the dead many times, using the Red God's last kiss. Could it be then that Melisandre was once brought back from the dead by some other Red Priest in the past? Perhaps that is why she is such a devoted follower. She is a direct witness to R'hllor's mercy and a living, breathing example of his power. Thoros of Myr became more of a pious priest after he performed a resurrection for the first time. The damp hairs drowned men also seem to come back more devoted to the drowned god. A brush with death can cause a person to become religious. Look at Lancel Lannister. A similar thing could have happened to Melisandre. If magic is what has allowed her to live beyond a normal human lifespan, then she could be considered not just Stannis' true queen, but his corpse queen. Melisandre has given birth to two shadow assassins using Stannis' life force. While she calls these fleeting figures sons, she has yet to give him a living son. Such a child would be base born and not fit to sit the Iron Throne, however, unless Stannis happened to legitimize him. Selyse Baratheon has given the king an heir, a daughter named Shireen, a homely child who Maester Crescent has described before his death as the saddest child he had ever known. She was born with her father's hard, square facial features. She inherited prominent ears from the Florence side of her family. As an infant, she contracted grayscale, an affliction which nearly killed her and left the flesh of half of her face the color of stone and just as hard. She may not be compared in beauty to other princesses such as Marcella, Ariane, or the Realm's Delight, but she is her father's heir, and should he die, she would be the rightful queen. But Shireen will never see the Iron Throne. She will never see her home of Dragonstone again, or see her cousin, Edric Storm. Shireen will never see adulthood. Her fate lies in the flames. What we learned from the show is that Stannis Baratheon will burn his daughter in an act of desperation. The question is when and why. The circumstances of how this came to be on the show do not match with Stannis' circumstances in the books. On the show, Stannis took his family and Melisandre as he marched his army upon Winterfell. In the books, Stannis left his family at the Wall. He and his army are currently occupying an abandoned crofter's village where they have remained since the end of Book 5. But they cannot remain there forever. Winter has come. Stannis must march and defeat the Boltons and Freys if he hopes to survive this ordeal. There are two big battles readers are anticipating in the Winds of Winter. The Battle of Fire in Marine and the Battle of Ice in the North. The Crofter's village that Stannis' army occupies rests between two lakes. His men have cut holes into the frozen faces of the lakes 
to find fish, but according to Ned Woods, a character familiar with the area, this could prove to be disastrous. Quote, I know them lakes. You've been on them like maggots on a corpse. Hundreds of you. Cut so many holes in the ice, it's a bloody wonder more haven't fallen through. Out by the island, there's places that look like a cheese the rats have been at. Lakes are done. You fish them out. End quote. If Ramsey is leading an army to the wall to take his bride back and his reek, as he threatens to do in his dread letter, he will have no choice but to engage with Stannis first. Stannis may use the weakened frozen lakes to his advantage. This is the same tactic Prince Joshua used against his brother, King Elias, in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, a series which I have said many times is a huge influence on A Song of Ice and Fire. Once the battle is done, Stannis will need to take Winterfell, but then he must needs make his way back to the Wall. That is where the enemy he believes he was born to fight resides. But after his first deadly march in the Battle of Ice, his forces will be severely weakened. He will be in desperate need of relief. This may be what leads to the sacrifice of Shireen. Some believe that Melisandre will make this great sacrifice without Stannis' involvement. Perhaps Elise, who has displayed no strong affection for her daughter, will agree to the sacrifice as well. It would not be the first time she and Melisandre arranged for people to be burned alive without Stannis' permission. Lord Gunster Sunglass and Sir Hubert Rampton's two sons were consigned to the flames for the act of treason by Selyse and Melisandre. It may be that Melisandre confers with Selyse and tells her of Lord Stannis' plight. When Selyse wonders how Stannis can be saved, Melisandre will suggest a weather spell, something similar to the one she used to blow Stannis' fleet north. To quote a Davos chapter, Melisandre had given Alistair Florent to her god on Dragonstone to conjure up the wind that bore them north. Lord Florent had been strong and silent as the queen's men bound him to the post, as dignified as any half-naked man could hope to be, but as the flames licked up his legs, he began to scream, and his screams had blown them all the way to Eastwatch by the sea, if the Red Woman could be believed. Davos had misliked that wind, it seemed to him to smell of burning flesh, and the sound of it was anguished as it played amongst the lines. End quote. The size of this new spell, however, would require a larger sacrifice. Stannis' men have urged him time and again to burn Asha Greyjoy to keep the cold at bay. Asha is a princess. Her father Balon died as king of the Iron Isles. Stannis has denied his men, telling them to pray harder instead. But their situation grows more dire with each passing day. Perhaps Melisandre and Selyse will decide to burn Shireen to save Stannis. Or, if Stannis takes Winterfell, there may be an exchange of ravens. Melisandre may propose the idea to Stannis, and he will approve her request to do the unthinkable. Such an act would be easier to allow from a distance. Melisandre will first attempt to use Mance Raider's infant son, but when she finds him missing, the only one that remains at the wall with King's blood is Shireen. Well, no, there is another, but we will move on for now. I much prefer the idea that Stannis gives the order. It goes to show how truly desperate Stannis has become. You only feel the full weight of it if it is Stannis who agrees to the sacrifice. This is what his story has been building up to. People may find this hard to believe, that Stannis is capable of approving or committing such an act. One could argue Stannis might be a cold, merciless man, but he is not a child killer. It takes a certain kind of person to order the death of an innocent child. Yet Robert Baratheon thought his brother capable of such an act. When he sent Stannis to Dragonstone to bring him the remaining Targaryen heirs, Viserys, who was only a little boy, and Daenerys, who was only an infant. Jon Snow, who has just met Stannis and only knows him from what Donald Noy has told him, thinks Stannis capable of burning an infant alive, and so he sends the child away with Gilly and Sam. 
No man is as accursed as the Kinslayer. Would Stannis dare to violate one of Westeros's major unwritten laws? Sir Davos, who knows Stannis best of all, fears that he would burn Edric Storm, Stannis's own nephew. The life of one boy to save the realm. Sir Davos sends Edric away, risking his life to save the boy. But that was a nephew, a bastard boy that Stannis harbored ill feelings for. Stannis must love his daughter. He is her father after all, and she is the only child he has, his heir. This might not be strong evidence to support my theory, but it shocked me when I realized Stannis and Shireen share no scenes together at all. We have seen Sir Davos interact with Stannis' daughter more times than Stannis himself. We are told that Stannis barely visited his family on Dragonstone when he was serving on Robert's Council in King's Landing. Stannis' coldness extends to his own family. To be fair, Catelyn Stark shares no scenes with Rickon or Sansa and she has but a brief interaction with Arya but she thinks of her children with great love. She fears Bran and Rickon will think her a cold, unnatural mother for abandoning them to be by Rob's side in the Riverlands. Stannis has no such affection for Shireen. When he talks of her, it's only about duty. He even offered to disinherit her in favor of naming Renly his heir. Stannis believes such sacrifices are worth it when discussing Edric with Lord Davos. Quote, your grace, said Davos, the cost, I know the cost. Last night gazing into the hearth, I saw things in the flames as well. I saw a king, a crown of fire on his brows, burning, burning Davos. His own crown consumed his flesh and turned him into ash. Do you think I need Melisandre to tell me what that means? Or you? The king moved so his shadow fell upon King's Landing. If Joffrey should die. What is the life of one bastard boy against the kingdom? Everything, said Davos softly. End quote. The debate over whether it is right for Stannis to burn Edric or not, even if it means saving the realm, is set up for what's to come with Shireen. The story has established that yes, Stannis would consider sacrificing a child for the greater good. Now, he must weigh the option when he learns that child is his own daughter. How much is Stannis willing to sacrifice to win the Iron Throne? What is Stannis willing to do if he thinks he is meant to save the world? Once long ago, I feared Melisandre would sacrifice a prince, not a princess. In A Storm of Swords, Melisandre has Davos arrested after seeing in the flames he was going to kill her. Melisandre visits him in his dungeon cell and tells him this, quote, You do not believe me. You doubt the truth of R'hllor even now, yet have served him all the same, and will serve him again. I shall leave you here, to think on all that I have told you, and because R'hllor is the source of all good, I shall leave the torch as well." With a smile and a swirl of scarlet skirts, she was gone. Only her scent lingered after. That and the torch. End quote. You have served him before and will serve him again. What could this mean? We know the first time Davos served Rolor, when he smuggled Melisandre into Storm's Inn so that she could unleash a shadow assassin to kill Sir Courtney Penrose. Melisandre had previously met Sir Courtney when he and Stannis had a parley. Remember, shadow binders must see their targets before they can attack them. But how else might Davos serve Rolor in the future? Davos is currently on another secret mission, this one to bring back Prince Rickon Stark on the orders of Wyman Manderley. Davos' journey will no doubt bring him back to the Wall before returning to Winterfell. I once considered it possible Melisandre would seize Rickon and use him as an offering of King's blood. Davos sending off Edric Storm to protect him from being burned only to deliver another child to Melisandre would be a painful twist in this tale. And it stands to reason Melisandre, Selys, and Stannis would be much more inclined to sacrifice a child they have no relationship with. The brother of a traitor would mean very little to them. 
Stannis has always been presented as a character to be feared, even before he made his introduction in Clash. His reputation as being just but harsh, vengeful and without mercy preceded him. And there has always been something ominous about him as well, which further leads me to believe he will become the future Night's King. In a clash of kings before the Battle of the Blackwater, Sansa Stark goes to pray at the Sept out of fear for her future. Quote, The mother's altar and the warriors swam in light, but Smith and Crone and Maid and Father had their worshippers as well, and there were even a few flames dancing below the stranger's half-human face. For what was Stannis Baratheon if not the stranger come to judge them? End quote. Sansa, who had never met Stannis, felt it fit to compare him to the Stranger, the God of Death. When Stannis' army nears the walls of Winterfell, Theon Greyjoy and the rest of the castle's occupants react as if Stannis' arrival is like death knocking on the castle's gates. Quote, Then he heard the horn, a long, low moan. It seemed to hang above the battlements, lingering in the black air, soaking deep into the bones of every man who heard it. All along the castle walls, sentries turned toward the sound, their hands tightening around the shafts of their spears. In the ruined halls and keeps of Winterfell, lords hushed other lords, horses nickered, and sleepers stirred in their dark corners. No sooner had the sound of the war horn died away than a drum began to beat. Boom doom, boom doom, boom doom, and a name passed from the lips of each man to the next, written in small white puffs of breath. Stannis, they whispered. Stannis is here. Stannis is come. Stannis, Stannis, Stannis. Theon shivered. To the phrase in Bolton's, Stannis is fulfilling his role as Night's King. What's happening in Winterfell is a microcosm of what's been happening all across Westeros. As the High Lords fight amongst themselves, Night's King has marshaled his forces and is now here to judge them all. Quote, Enough, roared Lord Ramsay, brandishing his bloody spear. Another threat and I'll gut you all myself. My Lord Father has spoken. Save your wrath for the pretender Stannis. Roose Bolton gave an approving nod. As he says, there will be enough time to fight each other once we are done with Stannis. He turned his head, his pale, cold eyes searching the hall until they found the bard Abel beside Theon. Singer, he called, come sing us something soothing. End quote. And it seems Theon's fate in the books may just match his fate on the show, because in that crofter's village near Winterfell, Stannis holds Theon captive. Theon is at the mercy of Night's King. If we can agree on nothing else, I think we can all agree Melisandre has been reading her flames wrong. She may have convinced herself otherwise, but Stannis Baratheon is not Azor Ahai reborn. Melisandre tells Jon that Dragonstone is the place of smoke and salt that is mentioned in the prophecy, but Jon correctly points out that Stannis Baratheon was not born on Dragonstone. As a Storm Lord, he was born in the Storm Lands, at Storm's End. In that way, Stannis also draws parallels with King Elias from Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, who became the vessel for the vengeful spirit of Prince Inaluki, who was also known as the Storm King. Stannis is also the Storm King. Not only is the place of birth wrong, but the sword he wields, Lightbringer, is wrong as well. It is a blade of great beauty and shines prettily enough, but as Maester Aemon put it, this false light can only lead us into a deeper darkness. If Stannis leads his men against the others, he will fall, and his men will fall with him. This was not his fight to lead, but that might not be the end of him. Maester Aemon believes Daenerys is the real Azor Ahai reborn. He views her dragons as proof. It was a prince that he and Rhaegar looked for, not a princess. Daenerys herself saw in a vision a blue-eyed king who cast no shadow and was told by the Undying she would be the Slayer of Lies. It seems then that Stannis will be another enemy that Daenerys must defeat 
in her quest to take the Iron Throne. Martin intends for many of the major characters to convene in Westeros for one giant battle. Danny, with her Unsullied, her Dothraki, her dragons, and other forces must soon come to Westeros. We hope. I believe that Sansa will bring the armies of the Vale north. Stannis has gathered the northern clans. Nymeria's wolf pack may even play a part. There may come a time for wolves. This is where Rob's letter comes into play, and the story of Night's King is repeated once more. Jon Snow may not want another title forced upon him when he is resurrected, but Rob's will may just name him as King in the North. He will begrudgingly accept the title to rally the Northmen against their common enemy. When Mance Raider reveals he is not dead, the Wildlings will flock to him once more. Their king has returned. The King in the North and the King Beyond the Wall will join their forces as they have done many times in the past, and they will take on the others. Among the legions of the undead, they might find a unique enemy. The Whites remember things from when they were alive, we are told. They act upon these memories. Stannis Baratheon is a man that holds deep grudges and old griefs, gnawing on them like bones in the night. He is not the true steel like Robert nor was he the pretty copper like Rinley. Stannis is brittle like iron. He would break before bending. He will be the same in death. With his crown of red gold and bright blade, Stannis may rise again, and in rising, he will remember. This knight's king will lead his host south toward the one thing he so desperately tried to claim in life, the Iron Throne. There will be a grand battle as Daenerys saw in a dream. Quote, that night she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the trident, but she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice, but she bathed them in dragon fire and they melted away like dew and turned the trident into a torrent. End quote. The usurper was what the Targaryens called Robert. Now that he's gone, Stannis has inherited that title as well. This new usurper this new Night's King will be burned in fire as both Stannis and Daenerys saw in their separate visions. And that's it, Stannis Baratheon will be the new Night's King. Maybe not in name, but he is already following a similar path as the Lord Commander of old. Thank you all for watching, I hope you all enjoyed, and if you did, it's time to call the banners. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below if you think there will be a new Night's King. Don't forget to do the patch face two step and hop from one foot to the other before you ring that bell and turn on notifications. Thanks to the following Patreon supporters and channel members, including Philip E. Again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all for the next one.